All right, so we talked about different types of versions of the logics we, we learned, we, we uh, understood how to write different types of repetition logic for with loops like do while and for loop. And we learned how to um, kind of expand uh, the, the decision making logic from if to and if else if else if else if type of a thing when I want to select one out of many or use something like switch statement to select one thing to be equal to a value out of many. Um, these are all good things to write programs for, but a uh, problem that we have at the moment is that we cannot keep anything in the memory when we are do dealing with something like your workshop. The workshop that you are doing, you're supposed to read series of marks and print the minimum and maximum, right? But if I told you list all the marks after they are entered, I hope you kind of worked on it a little, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll um, demonstrate, but just <clears throat> think about it for a second. Now what you're doing is that you write a repetition logic, loop, any kind of loop that you have, and I'm telling you I have 40 students and I want the marks of the students to be entered into the system and uh, print the minimum and maximum and average, fine. You, everything that the user is entering got off the right off the spot when user is entering, you test it with the things that have been already entered and you find that, not testing with the things that are already entered, testing with comparison logic that you are putting against the last thing that was entered, let's put it that way. If the tenth value was entered and I want to do something with the first value that was entered, it's impossible because it's gone. Or a very simple thing, if I told you get 50 numbers or five numbers and print them in reverse order, can't do it because that requires for you to remember all five. Where in a repetition logic, you get one variable at a time. We learned that a character is a variable and I can hold one letter in it. What if you want to hold your name in something? What are you going to do? Like, create 50 variables, A, B, C, D, E, F, and one by one, put it in there and print them. You can't do that. For problems like this, we need to be able to keep everything that is coming in some kind of a series of things that are held back to back in memory. I need to be able to, uh, if I'm receiving 10 numbers, I need to be able to keep all 10 of them and then go back and revisit them. Maybe I ask you to get uh, all the student marks and print them in ascending order. So show me first the lowest one and keep going with all the things with the student number of the uh, uh, students who got those marks. How can you do such a thing? It is, it's almost impossible. Um, the, to do something like this, we have a new construct that it's a new, these type of constructs are called uh, a data structure. We have a data structure, but before doing anything, uh, that was the, that's the topic of today. So how we can keep everything that user enters into a piece of memory, access them afterwards one by one. Uh, be able to index them, say this is the first thing that they entered, this is the second thing, this is the third thing. I can go back and see what was the third thing. I can uh, check and see what was the 59th uh, social insurance number that was entered. Things like that. So that's the topic of today. Um, but before uh, going through that, any questions on the previous topics that we've talked about? Any problematic parts that you want me to point it out before I get into this one? Not that my, I cannot submit my workshop because my matrix account is this and that. I don't want to, I mean like um, knowledge, knowledge based type of question. Oh yeah, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, so, so, so do you understand while loop? So what is the difference between a do while and a while loop? Oh, you're talking about the, oh, so you're talking about buffered input. So that's the thing. So, so you don't understand how buffered input works. Okay. For that, uh, let, me, let me do this. So I don't know where I'm, oh, let me just. OK, good. That's as far as I can go. All right. So your keyboard, the memory of your keyboard is series of characters that are back to back. One thing you need to understand about keyboard, that keyboard is not part of your computer. Keyboard is a separate computer connected to your computer. So the laptop that you have in front of you, that keyboard is a complete separate entity. It has nothing to do with your computer. There are two separate computers talking with each other. Are we okay with that? Now, the values entered inside a keyboard are in a queue waiting to be sent into your computer. I didn't do anything. <laughs> so, just a second. So, uh, when you enter something into the keyboard, like I'm putting my name, I'm, I'm putting over here, Fred, okay? How does the computer know it should start reading? There are two separate things. It should start getting the information. That's when you hit enter. So when you hit enter, that's the time that computer starts reading one by one everything. Where should it stop? At the enter, right? That's how it works. Are we OK down to this point? So that's how the keyboard works. If you can enter hundreds of key keys into your keyboard and don't push the enter and nothing happens because uh, Today, everything's weird. OK, suddenly this paused. So your computer is waiting for the signal from keyboard that I should start reading. And that's how it works. So let's say you enter A, no, 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 ABC is not good. Um, OK? And it is. <laughs> OK, so let's say you enter 1, 2, 3, and A, B, C, right? Your computer is waiting for you. And then you hit the Enter. So you're OK if I put backslash N for Enter. So you put backslash N, and computer starts reading, right? And you told to the computer to read an integer. What can the computer read? Computer reads one, it says it's an integer, good. Two, it's an integer, good. Three, it's still valid, good. Four, it goes to here. A, that's not an integer, it will stop. Now it can translate this to zeros and ones and put it in here that is corresponds to the value one, two, three, right? And it stops because it can't read anything anymore. Those are not valid integers. What happens to these? They're stayed in a keyboard, right? Waiting for you to either read them or throw them away. What did I do? I said, hey, start reading everything one by one. So it keeps reading one by one while that ch is not equal to backslash n. What does it mean? So it reads a. 
CH is A, right? Is A backslash N? No, it goes back up. So this is gone. Now it reads B. Is B backslash N? No. C. Is C backslash N? No. Backslash N. That's it. It comes out. Therefore, the last one is read. The keyboard is empty, ready for the next thing to come in. That is the process of flushing keyboard. And why we can always call that after a data entry? Let's assume the data entry you are doing is actually a valid thing. So let's say you are entering one, two, three, and you're hitting enter. Compiler, sorry, your computer, because you said read an integer, read these, right? Is backslash in an integer? No. So it's in the memory. It's in your keyboard. Okay? So calling that flush, what will, what will it do? It reads the backslash in and immediately stops. So it is safe because the how the data entry, buffer data entry is working to call that flush thingy after every, every single thing. The question comes back in, how come it worked before? You said that backslash n is not an integer. So what if I ask two integers to be entered into the computer? What if I said enter, uh, anybody has a napkin by any chance of any kind? It's really sad to ask for something like that. Why did it work then before? So let's say you enter one, two, three. The one, two, three is entered. And the computer reads that thing, and this backslash and remains in memory. Now user enters four and five, five and four, five and five, and does backslash n again. Now what is in the keyboard is this, backslash n, five, five, backslash n, correct? And the next one is being read. All the standard readings in C language, except from get cat, like anything that you do with scanf, anything that you read with scanf says, I'm going to skip white space characters until I get to something. So if you enter 55, or if you enter space, 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 these are not dashes, these are spaces. You hit space 55 and you hit enter. When you do read an integer using scanf, uh, scanf says space, 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 space. Uh huh, let me see. Five, good, five, good, reads it. Skips all the white spaces, right? Backslash n is a white space character. What are the white space characters? White space characters are space, not dash, space, okay? It's backslash n, it's backslash t, it's backslash, backslash r, uh, backslash, what else? Uh, f for form feed, backslash b, for backspace. So these are things that are not being printed. They are, they are white space character. Any of these stay in your thing, and after that you put 22 and you hit backslash n. Everything skipped, and that picks it up. That's why it worked till now. But because we are getting into foolproof data entry, it's a good idea to always have a clean keyboard to come in. And that's why always calling the flush after reading won't hurt because we have at least one backslash in over there that will skip. Does that make sense now? All right. And moment of truth. Let's see if this thing goes on. So that was actually a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? One of those enlightening questions before we continue? Okay, and uh, because the, the other class of mine has a lab and today we are doing the demo that we have done with you, we're not gonna have a break, we're gonna go uh, 10, 15 minutes early. So I can run to the lab at the fourth floor and, <laughs> and start the lab over there for them. Uh, so we're good down to this point. Questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right, so how do we create many variables in one shot? Okay, so if I want to create many variables, like if I want to create integer A, B, C, D, E, 
f. Fine. I created one, two, three, four, five, six integers now, right? What if I want to create 5,000? <laughs> I'm going to not have enough names, right? You can always ask the compiler to create series of variables and then number them with a sequence number. We call that index. So you want five integers. You write you write integer A5. That means you have five integers created now. And this is part is the part that is confusing for newbies in in programming. How many fingers? Five. Start from zero. How far you can go? Zero, one, two, three, four. Right? Got it? Remember that. That's computer science. We always start from zero. When you have five things, their index starts from zero, goes up to four. When you have 50 things, there's, their index starts from zero, going up to 49. So whatever you create, that index is your doom, which means if you say A5, you're crashing your computer. Why? Because you're going out of your memory. This is how actually an array works. An array is something like this. And it has, let's say, one, two, three, four, and five in values in it. When you create an array, an array actually is like this. So you have this. This is A of ours that we have. So that's uh, the A. And that A is pointing to the beginning of the array. That's how it's created. So when you say A0, this is A0. And then you say A1, and then you say A2, and then you say A3, and then you say A4. OK? When you say A5, where is it going to go? Outside of your array, somewhere in the memory of the computer, which doesn't belong to you. Two possibilities in here. Number one, you go out and you do something, and that memory is not used, and you don't get any error, and your program runs. That's the worst type of thing that can happen, and I'll tell you why. Number two, you go out. It's your program, no one else's. So the memory that you have that thing in is your executable in the program. So your executable crashes. That's a good thing. OK, your program crashes, then you debug it, and you, you, you'll be OK with it. Number three, you go out, and it's not yours. It's actually operating systems, and operating system stops you. These days, it's the case. Like old times, operating systems were not stopped. They were not that smart. You would do it, and you would crash the entire computer doing that. I, as a uh, newbie, once I tried to see what is the memory of the system that we had back in school a long time ago. So I did it like that, and I kept going until it can't go anymore. I, I didn't know how to do these things. It was like, I was like. 14 years old. So, so I kept going, and, uh, and I just ruined the whole uh, memory of the computer. I'm poof, the computer went down. So things like that can happen. Now, what I'm saying is it's, it's my own PC at home. It was like, an, you don't even know what it is. It was like an XT computer. You had no idea what it was. But um, anyways, if you, put, if you put 5 million of those computers that I had, it's your cell phone. Now that you're holding in your hand, just letting you know. Anyway, so, so that's that. So why I said if it doesn't tell you, that's the worst case scenario. The reason is that you write your program, you go one extra. Because you said A5, subconsciously, you thought the index 5 actually exists, and you put something in it. And program doesn't crash for some lucky thing, actually unlucky thing. You do your program, you finish it, you give it to the client, 
Seven years later, your program crashes. And then you have to go back and try to find out seven years later what you wrote. Two weeks after you have written, you forget what you've done, right? It's just imagine so it's a long time. So you have to be extremely careful. C language does not know what is the size of the arrays you create. It just doesn't know. If you keep going, it's going to keep going. There is nothing to prevent you from stopping. That's why you should remember how many things you have. We're going to teach you a few tricks to see how we can remember, but you will see. So, so that's what happens. When you say five integers, you have up to, up to index four. Please remember that, OK? How do we recall all these? How do we recall all these things? We use the same syntax we use to create them. So if I want to read five integers, I think I have my get int over here somewhere, right? Um, do I have a get int here? Yes, I do have a get int. I'm going to use that. So I have five integers over here. I'm going to say over here, printf, enter five integers. OK, and I go to new line. Now I'm going to write my for loop. It's easier because at, right at the beginning, I know how far I'm going. So I'm going to say for i set to 0, i less than 5, and i plus plus. Is this safe? Yes, because I said i less than 5, it will go until 1 before 5, right? So that's a standard loop to go for an array. So start from 0, go up to 5, which means 4. When the loop exits over here, this is one of the questions you're going to get. If I say over here, printf percent %d and i, what is printed at line 13? You don't need to walk through it. What is going to get printed? Thank you. What is going to get printed? What is going to, should I bring the microphone? What is it going to get, what's going to get printed? Everybody's saying it right. Why? Five. Why, why five is going to get printed? Because that's the condition of the loop to break. Loop keeps going. If it, if it wasn't five, it would have kept going, right? So it stops because it became five. So usually, the condition that you have when it's less than something, it means this is the first time the condition goes wrong, and that's when it becomes 5. So remember that, OK? This is something that you need to know. So now in here, I can start getting the integers. So I can say over here something like printf, and I put a row so they know what it is. I'll put percent %d, and I'm going to put a column in, right, like that. And I'm going to put show i, so it's going to actually show the show the uh, the index that I'm having, and and then in here uh, I'm going to go. Uh, I could go scanf. So, but I, we have get int. Get int does the thing, anyways. Uh, did I do the flushing in the get int, or I did not? Do I have a flush key? Yes, I do, and I'm flushing it. Good. Okay, so we're good. So so now in here I'm going to say what am I going to say? I'm going to say uh, uh, a i is set to get int. So that's how I do it. So essentially, i over here becomes 0, so that's the first one. Then i becomes 1, that's the second one. Then i becomes 2, that's the third one. And it keeps going like that and puts everything inside those five arrays. OK? So let's walk through it see, and see how it's going to work out. Oh, I need to, I have the utils, good. So in here, I'm going to start with, uh, so to see what the content of a, seriously? Give me line number. Oh, get int is capital. See, that's that I don't like. Eh, camel notation, that's, we should have made it small, all small. But, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. So. Thank you for those people who started the workshop. That means you started the workshop. You know what the signature is. So how do we see what the contents of a variable is? If I bring the mouse over here over i, let me just come in first so it creates. If I go over i, it shows what the value is, right? When you go on an array, it shows actually the elements. You see that? 
But remember, that's only inside oh, the same thing. We'll, soon we're going to learn how we are going to pass uh, an array to another function. And you will see that this watch thingy doesn't work in other functions. It works where you create the array. So from line number 5 and line number 14, that's where the compiler can tell you what is the size because it has the size here. You'll later on, you'll, you'll see. So now we have those things. Now, if you want to actually see what those values are, you can right-click on the variable and add it to watch. So it adds it to watch as, oh, A5, sorry. And you can always edit it. So I'm going to do it like, like this. You can just put over here A. And now it shows, you see the values are shown over here? Now I can walk through and see what happens. So let's put this one at left, and this one is right, and now i is 0, it's going to print 0, and then it's going to receive an integer and put it in a0, okay? So the integer is going to be received, I'll put over the 10, and I hit enter, and as you see, a0 is now 10. You see that? Okay? And for loop, at the end of the loop, I++ happens, right? That's the rule for for loop. We said a for loop, this happens once at the beginning. This condition, it checks every single time. At the end of the loop, I will be added by 1. Now I is 0. When it comes up, I becomes 1. So it comes back up. And now adds 1 to i, i becomes 1, 1 is printed over there, right? And then it receives the next one. Now I'm going to put 20 in here. And as you see, the second one is now 20. Now the beautiful thing about this is that by the time I get to this point, All five variables are set, and I have them all. Now I can go back and see what was the first one. So you don't have to do minimum and maximum and average in this loop anymore. You can write another loop to find the minimum and maximum. You can write another loop to find your average. You can go through all these data over and over and do different type of processes over it. You have everything in your hand now. It's not one shot to get something and that's it. Sometimes that's desirable, but not now. Okay? So this is for testing, I understand. But, but how can I stop the debugging? There is a Shift F5. See, I've never used that. It's actually Shift F5. Good. So Shift F5. There you go. That stops the debug. So we're okay uh, on how arrays are created and accessed. Now, I want you to appreciate AI is a variable, and it's an integer, one integer. Remember that. And anything you did with a regular variable, you can do with an element of an array. This is called an element of an array. That's the entire array. So remember, five integers, 0, 2, 4. Are we okay with this down to this point? Okay. Now, so if I want to do this using scanf, how do I do it? We treat AI as an individual variable. Therefore, I can say scanf percent %d. And then I have to put address of variable, right? This is address of. This is address of. And the variable is AI. So you treat that element as if the entire thing is a name of a variable. There is no problem with that. Are we OK? And I run this. So, so for the next uh, thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for the next, for the next round, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say 4, i set to 4, and i greater than or equal to 0, and i minus minus. So I go backwards. This is something that you could never do, ever, with. Like if I told you, right uh, before knowing arrays, if I told you, write a program that prints the numbers that are received backwards, you couldn't do it. 
because you didn't have the numbers. Now I have all the numbers. I can say printf. Let's make it comma separated. So I'm going to put over here, I'm going to say if i is not equal to 0, it means it's, the, uh, it's not the first one. So I'm going to uh, print a comma. And then after that, I'm going to say printf percent d and ai. And then after that, I'm going to say uh, put care new line. So, like, what I would do in my utils is this. too many characters for a new line. So anytime I want to go to new line, I'll go to new line. So NL is new line. That makes your life beautiful, right? So the functions are good, like it makes your life easier, okay? So I'm going to go to a new line. And, and uh, another thing, like what the hell is an NL? I don't know. This is what you do. You go to its prototype, take a look. Three times slash, let's see what happens. One, two, and boom. You see that? So it shows parameter. There is no parameter, right, in here. So you're going to say nothing. So it receives nothing. It's going to say prints a new line character on console. OK? What's good about this when you do something like this? When you come to your program, you bring your mouse over here, see what happens. Prints new line character on console, and parameter is nothing. OK? Very useful. Very, very useful. So now, if I run the program, it literally receives the numbers, and it says here over there, go 10, 20, 30. 40 and 50, and it, what did it do? Oh, not equal to four. Muscle memory. Let's do it one more time. Because it starts from four. So 10, 20, mm, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Now it actually shows a problem. Okay. So those are the values I entered in reverse order. Uh, questions about this? That's it. The thing is that when you, when you teach something new, the concept is very simple. I'm going to say, OK, now you learned the array. Now let's build the rocket, go to the Mars. So it's, you, can, you can have many applications coming out of this. Um, so, uh, one of the most important things that we can get out of this is to be able to get our names, actually. OK? Uh, to your question about uh, buffered entry, take a look at this. If I put 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, what's going to happen on the first one? So the Scanf will read 10 because it can't read anymore. It stops, right? But I have all those things in a buffer, correct? Therefore, the next scanf is going to pick the rest and keep going out to the end, and this happens. You see that? So it keeps bringing the prompt, and then, but everything actually read. Are we okay with this? Do we understand this? Right? So that's buffered entry. So um, we can. Prevent those things. Like in that get int of ours, our get int is not prevent is not lo looking at this. But if when we are doing that get int thingy, we can actually make it foolproof. So if people add stupid stuff like this, we can say, hey, don't. But well, we're gonna come to it and we're gonna work on it as we are going through our our subject, but uh, our um, uh, studies, probably next week. Okay.
after you do your test, then we have one more thing to go before the study break. That's where we're going to go through all the foolproofing stuff, and we're going to write some code together. But for now, let's just stand at this. Just Now, I'm going to use that. Is, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I'm going to take that to my advantage. Please take it. So are we OK with this? Anybody have any problem with this part? I want to play a trick to be able to keep our names in something. Are we OK with this? Before continuing, let me tell you a little bit more about syntax of an array. To initialize i, we can just write, put it right over here as 0, right? So i becomes 0. I don't have to put this over here anymore. I can do that. And in here, I do not need to say i is set, is set to 4. Why? Because i was 4. That's why the for loop ended. So I can remove the first two over here. No statement to execute before the for loop. I can do that. No problem. If I run this program, i is initialized. It's working. So if, if I actually run it, like first I'll run it to show you. And then you'll see. So one, two, three, four, five. Oh, oh, i is five. My, sorry. So one, two, three, four, five, and it goes like that, right? Well, what I'm saying is that it gets initialized over here, and i becomes zero. How do I initialize the a thingy over here? How do I do that? The initialization of a comes from math set theory and applications. Sets in math is done with accolades, curly brackets, we call it. So if I want to set the values of this, I can actually say equals to and do this. Then start writing 20, 30, 40, 50. OK? Now, as you see, I put four of them, right? So what happens to the last one? The thing is that you have to uh, remember, uh, uh, realize what happens over here. This is a 0, that is 20. This is a 1, that is 30. This is a 2, that is 40. This is a 3, that is 50. So a 4, when you initialize an array and you go short of the number that actually the array is, the rest will be all set to zeros, no matter what you have. If it's an array of doubles, array of characters, whatever it is, it literally sets it to 0. So if, so if I actually. Print that over here right off the bat. So in here, if I say i is equal to 0, i less than 5, and i plus plus, and print this as a comma separated value. This should be i not, not equal to 0. OK? And then I pr uh, get the five things. So I want to initially see how many, how many, and what do I have in that array originally? If you don't put anything, do not. If you do not initialize it, this is what you get, right? You get garbage, and then you you overwrite it, of course, with whatever you have, right? Are we okay down to this point? Now, what happens if I only set the first one? The answer is, when you set one of them, the rest will be 0. That's always the way. So if I told you you have an array and set the entire array to 0, all you need to do is to set the first one to 0, and everything becomes 0. Right? Obviously, if you want to go through having different values for every and each, you can do it. There is no problem with that. Right? But 
if you put extra stuff, that's a beautiful thing about the IDE. It actually tells you, hey, you're going one extra. We didn't have that. You don't have that on Matrix. On Matrix, you don't have an IDE. That's the difference between an IDE and just a text editor to edit stuff. So you do that and you compile and run the program, it won't allow you over here. But in your, in, on Matrix, if you run this program, it's going to crash right at the beginning because you just overwrote something. I don't know what's after that. Okay? So be careful about that. Are we okay with initializing the array? So let's save this. So I'm going to say A arrays syntax and We learned that we can pass a variable to a function, correct? That's no regular, no normal variable. Like passing an array to a function is not, does not mean the same thing as passing uh, a single variable. When you are passing, so let's say this comma separated printing of an integer, I want to write it in a function. So if I want to write that in a function, so if I want to have these things, because I, I'm doing it over here, then I'm doing it down here. Of course, one is backwards, one is forward. But what I'm, uh, but the point is, my point is, I want to be able to print ascending normally, comma separate. I want to see what the values inside the array is. So I'm going to call it void prn array, or prn int array, sorry. So I have PR and int array. Then in here, I have to pass the array somehow. I don't know how. We'll find out. And then I have to pass the size to it to know. Because as I told you, C has no idea what is the size of an array. So in here, I have to say this is the size. And then after this, I can reuse my logic over here. Exactly what I did over there. No problem with it. So if I do something like this, and in here, instead of A, I'm going to have array, right? And in here, I'm going to have integer I. And this looks like a sound logic to me. The only problem is that I have no idea how to pass an array in here. Are we OK with this logic? Now, I want you to please. Please listen to me carefully and, and understand this point. This is a very important moment, OK? Um, that's going to shape many things that is coming in future. So if I say print array, the syntax of passing the array into the array is to write the exact same array, but because we cannot pass the size, because the C language is not capable of doing that, we're going to just create, put an empty square bracket in front of it. So I'm telling to print array, what's coming in is an array. I don't know how many. This is the size, though. I'll give it to you how many in a second variable. That's how I pass an array to a function. What is the side effect of this? What happens is that here is where you create an array with a body, correct? So A is pointing to several things in memory, right? When you create an array without a body, what happens? You're essentially saying A becomes array in here, correct? Therefore, in that function, this will be array. 
And that array is not bringing the elements. It's only bringing the name of the array. So it's going to point to the same thing that the other one has. So it's kind of giving it a remote control. So in here, you have access to the array. You not only have an access, it's not a copy of it anymore. Remember, like when you pass an, a, a, a variable into a function, it receives it, and that variable is a copy of what you have. You can do whatever you want to do with it. Nothing happens to the original because it's a copy, right? So in here, the size, for example, when the size is passed into this one, so instead of printing this, I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it like this. So I'm going to remove this, and I'm going to call it PRN array. Enter what? Okay, PRN int array, and in here I'm going to say A and 5, as simple as that. So how is the function called then? The fun when the function is called, an, a bodyless array is created, which copies where this one is pointing to. Therefore, the array and print array points to the same array to that one. You have to be careful. If inside this you change the array, the original values in the function will change because they are sharing the same place in memory. It is very expensive. They could have designed the language so the whole array is passed, but that becomes too expensive. Imagine, when I say expensive, what does it mean expensive in computer science? Take more data and time. So let's say, I have 5,000 integers that I want to print. If it actually passed whole 5,000, it means my print array function would have needed 5,000 integers. And before it is called, 5,000 integers must get copied from this function to that function, and then it gets printed. And after it's done, 5,000 integer will be released. You know how much time consuming that's going to be? Is it easier, wouldn't it have been easier if you would come to the college, they would said IPC 144 NBB is this class, that's it. Instead of moving all 40 students everywhere, we would just change the professors. Wouldn't that be nicer? Less people going around? Believe me, if you did that, you would not have that much traffic in a hallway. You would come, oh, this is IPC. You, you put stuff over here, you go for lunch, you come back, everything is here. You don't move anything. We just bring the head of the class around, which is the prof, going here or there. The array remains the same. It's the same thing over here. You just pass the name of the array around. The body of the array remains the same. Because of that, you do not have too much movement. But you have to be careful. You have to be careful. If in IPC 144, let's say, I said IPC 144, I should have said first semester, my apologies. Let's say if you would have come to college, this was first semester section NBB. So if you had EAC 150, it would have been NBB. If you had IPC 144, it would have been NBB. So one class for all your stuff. Why didn't they do that, actually? It would have been nice, right? They didn't have to, this is any, anyways. Yeah, but. What I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that, if one of you are being naughty in class, in IPC 144, and I ask you to leave, pack your stuff, and go, then you would not only lose IPC 144, but you would lose all the other subjects that you have, because now you're out of the class where everything's going to be. The same thing over here. Be careful. If you change something in the function, the original array will change. It's not if I, so just to show you in here, if I, so first let's run it and see what happens. And you will see, um, and I'm going to give you the example for it so you'll see exactly what I mean when I talk about the, the array, uh, the, the C language doesn't know what the size of the array is. When I actually come over here, what did I do? One more time. So when I actually come up,
Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. I thought I'm pressing F10, but I was pressing F5. One more time. So when I'm calling the function, it comes over here. Now, as you see inside main, I can put the thing over here, and I have these values in A, correct? Now the function is being passed. So what happens? Array will point where A is pointing, and because it doesn't know what the size, I'm going to pass the 5 to size. So when it comes up, obviously for now, array is not set to anything, and integer is garbage. As soon as the function call is complete, size becomes 5, and look at the array. It doesn't know how many elements it has anymore. It only knows what is the first one, because it's pointing to it, right? So the first one it knows. It's sure that it, the first one is an integer. The rest, it has no idea. That's why we are. But, but if I actually treat that as an array, it won't complain. So it will actually run properly. If I actually come over here and go one by one, it's going to print array i that is 3. Then it's going to print array i that is 5. And it prints all the stuff I have in that one and print new line and get out. And then continue with whatever it has. Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay down to this point? Now, the beautiful thing about this, I'm going to take advantage of this side effect. I had print array, correct? Now I'm going to create a function called void read int array. Int array, int size. If what I said is correct, I can actually read the array in another function. I couldn't do that. In get int, I had to return an integer, correct? In here, I'm not returning any anything because I know they are pointing to the same place. So now if I bring the logic for enter five integers there, I can actually bring this over here, copy, and let's have the get int back over here. We know what the scanf does. So this becomes array, and i is an integer, and in here it's going to say print, enter, I'm going to put percent %d, and in here I'm going to say size integers, and the limit will be size. The good thing is that I can read any size array with this one now. And in here I'm going to go int b, 3. So I'm printing a, that's fine. Let's actually print garbage too. So I'm going to say print int array b and 3 right? And then in here, instead of actually doing like that, I can do this. Read int array a and 5, and read int array b and 5. Okay? And did I do something wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a, that would have been nice, actually. It would have made a mistake, and it would crash, and we would see how. So, <laughs> but it's okay. <clears throat> so, where? Line 7. Oh, that's size. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. So we are good down to this point. That's two. <clears throat> so when you go home, this print array, add another element to it, call it ascending. So int ascending. If int ascending is true, print it ascending. If it's false, print it descending. It's a challenge. OK? When you go home, because we want to print the array in ascending and descending order, you can actually modify this to this. <clears throat> Here. 
you can do this. So if ascending has one in it, printing it in ascending order. If it has zero in it, print it in descending order. So your function can print in both ways. Anyways, so now if I do like this, and I'm going to say uh, print int array. int array, and I'm going to put b and 3 over here. <clears throat> OK, so I think we're good. We can run this. Uh, I'm going to come right down to this point. We know how PR and int work. So when I run the program, it prints the first one properly, and second one's going to be garbage, right? Prints three garbage values. Now read int what happens. When I actually go to read int for the first one, now array is B, correct? Sorry, it's A. So A will be read in here because, as I mentioned before, A and array are pointing to the same place. Because that's the fact, when it's reading array, it is actually putting the value for the A. So when this thing is done, I think Shift F11 goes out. Shift F11, go Shift F11 goes out, so it is in here. I want it, the function to, to, to completely get executed. Come out and wait. So that's another debug thingy that you have. So if I go over here, you see it says step out. It's Shift F11. You see that? I want it to run the function and come out. Because we ran it, we know how it works. So I'm going to say Shift F11. So it's going to put over here 20, 10. 20, 30, and 40, and 50, and I come out. As soon as you come out, take a look at A. It is set exactly to those values. And now it's going to do the exact same thing for B. So I'm pressing F10 now. F10, it means step over. Run the whole thing as one command. It's not going to go inside anymore. Now in here, I'm going to put uh, 100, 200, and 300. And as soon as I come out, you'll see that B is now overwritten with 100, 200, and 300. So, and obviously, it's going to print it in reverse and yada, yada, yada. So let's run it right to this, run to cursor. It prints those things. It didn't print anything. What happened? Oh, because we did I minus minus, it went bad. It's supposed to be I is equal to 0. I is equal to zero. That's fine. Anyways, uh, stop it. I'm going to run the whole thing. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. That's the first one. 100, 200, and 300. And as you see, it is doing it that way. Sorry, I, my, uh, my brain is not working. This is four. This is supposed to be starting. I, I'm printing in reverse order. 10, 20, oh, 30, 40, 50, and 60, apparently, or another 50, and then uh, 100, 200, and 300. Now it's better. So there we go. So now uh, we understand that not only arrays are a bunch of variables back to back pointed to by their name, they can be accessed through their index like a regular variable. They can be passed to a function comfortably and easily. And the only thing we have to be careful about, not to change the array inside the function if we don't need it. OK? Are we OK down to this point? We have to actually have a mechanism for that. Yes, is that a question? You said in Python? Stop right there. Like, you talked about a language. It's like, I, I'm teaching you English, but you say, by the way, in Cantonese, it has nothing to do. They are two separate, completely entity, like different spoken language. Don't even try to understand one using another. Even worse, C-like languages, something like JavaScript, Java, C-sharp, do not 
try to think that they work the same way at all. So right now, backspace and stop the question right now. OK? <laughs> all right. So privately ask me, and I'll tell you, because that's going to confuse the heck out of everyone. I'm making out of lots of effort to make everything nice. Yes? No. That's C++. OOP244, third session. <laughs> No. When you have a lineup for Tim Hortons, they all have to be human beings. You cannot have a monkey, human being, goat, cow, and, a, and an elephant. They are all human beings. You can have a lineup of elephants to go drink water. You can do that. But you don't mix elephants and humans. That's what arrays are. <clears throat> Again, any, anything is possible when you are up there. We are down here. Can I have mixed type of arrays? Yes, you can. That's OOP3, actually OOP244, end of the semester. OK? Not now. Absolutely impossible. There is some way to find what the size of the array is, where you create the array. So inside the main, I can find it. But that's the most stupid thing. I just created it. Why do I need to know what the size is? I know what the size is. I created it. That's what I'm. That's that. That's two things I want to talk about. One, how to make something read only, so you don't change it by mistake. Okay. With arrays, you must be very careful, and I want you to please listen to me carefully on this. When you are writing a function. Turn your logic on. Don't turn it off. It's not a walkthrough. OK? When you are looking at a function, look at what the function is doing. What is the name of the function over there? What is the name of this function? Read integer array. Does it need to change the array? Yes, it's reading it. In here, print int array. What is it doing? Printing. Does it need to change it? No. If it doesn't need to change, you can always make it read only. We don't have such a thing. It's actually called const. <laughs> OK? If you say const, it means it's a constant integer array. You cannot change it. It's read only. So const means read only. Now, <clears throat> look at this. If by mistake, I print it. When I print it, I say array i is set to Zero, see what happens? It's going to say, expression must be a modifiable value. It is not. So it prevents you. If I remove the const, this, this is what happens. So it, essentially, this is one of those but it works moments. You are IPC144, you're going to come to me one day. You write a code for me, and I say, that's not right. And you tell me, but it works. OK, that's the worst thing you can say to an analyst, what it, but it works. It's not that, but it works. It's like, will it work in all times? OK, you have to be extremely careful. When you create a logic and the business of the logic, the goal of the logic is only to read stuff from an array, you always make it constant. So you don't shoot yourself in the foot by mistake. OK? If you don't put it, it works. You saw it worked. But if I don't put it, I can do stupid stuff like this and ruin things. So remember, when you are passing an array to a function, you have to always make sure that you put constant. <clears throat> are we OK with this? I didn't want to give you a break, but I will give you a break because I'm going to tell you something about that thing that I mentioned. Would it, be, it would be nice if we actually uh, have a specific variable for the name. You cannot have a variable like 
Like, for example, if I want to write uh, something over here and say, I want the number of integers to be 5, because this is whatever. Like, have something so I don't have to repeat it over and over. So I cannot have over here something like integer size a equals to 5 and put over here size of a. You can't do that. Sadly, the, when you create an array, the value inside must be a constant value. You can't do it. We have a way of doing it. It's through search and replace. Let's say over here, I replace all the fives that I have to size of A. Okay? <laughs> I have size of A over here, so that's 5. Yeah, let's put this one 5 over here. Okay, do I have anything? So if I write something like this, okay, and I told you I'm going to write the code like this, before you compile, search for all sizes of A's and change it with 5. Then it would work, right? So as I said, you have someone, an employee or somebody that helps you. Anytime you want to compile this code, please, before compilation, replace that with 5 or replace it with 6. So when it comes over here, you are passing it past the size of A. Are we okay with this? You can actually ask the compiler to do that for you. You can tell to the compiler, search for size. of A and replace it with 5. Search for and replace with 5. And I, it's not a metaphor. That's exactly what it's going to do. Remember, the fine, it's a search and replace, literally. I'm not making a, like, I'm not trying to teach you something by giving you a metaphor. It really is. So by doing something like that, your program runs for five integers. If you can recompile it to work for 10. So now if I run it, before the program runs, it's going to set it to five, and it's going to run for five integers, right? If I, and it's going to create five integers, correct? But if I want to, I can come over here and change this to 10. Because before compilation, this is changed to 10, this is changed to 10, this is changed to 10, everything's going to work for 10. If I run it again, now it's going to be enter 10 integers. Okay? So that's what you were looking for. That was your question. Define statement. Define is literally find and replace in the current document, not in others. So if you have another function doing something, not in there. Okay? If you want everything in all your applications to change size of A to 10, what do, I, what do you do? Where do you put it? In the, in the header file. If you put it in the header file, anywhere the header file is included, it's going to be replaced. OK? Does that make sense? Does that make sense for everyone? OK, so this, this, is, this defined statement is much more powerful than that. You're going to learn it in OP345. But this is like the beginning of it that I'm teaching you. It's a, an intelligent search and replace. But for now, we just do this. In OP345, you do wonders with defined statements. Let me tell you one thing. I had a, stu I had a friend. He started to, to study medicine. And then after a semester, he said, that's not for me. Went to computer science. OK? He works for Google now. This guy actually wrote uh, uh, with defined statements and stuff like that, with those hashtags as you're talking to the compiler, wrote something that when you include it, you could write Visual Basic in a C compiler, <laughs> and it would compile it for you. So it's very powerful. 
I'm just, but that's baby step. That's step number one. Don't think that that's the only thing it does, but for now, let's use it for that. Does that answer the question? All right. So shall I continue for another 20 minutes and then give you a break, or you want to go now for a break and then come back? Uh, so let's go. How many people go want to go for a break now? OK. I'm happy. All right. So, so that's what I just told you is all about arrays. Anything you need to know about arrays, how to create them, how to pass them around. Yes, sir. How does the find work? OK. You're giving it too much credit. Have you ever wrote, like, you, you want to get hired to, at some place, and you know somebody who did something, and you are writing, and you say, he did this, he did that. You go through the whole thing. Then you say, oh my god, that's a lady. What do you do? You search and replace for all the he's and change them to she, right? Don't give it thought. It changes this expression with this expression. Now, if I am dumb enough to put over here he, ha, it's going to change all my size of A's to he, ha. And guess what? If I compile this thing, my error message will be it shows C size of and says he, ha. Look, what does it say? Identifier he ha is undefined. Do you see a he ha? No, because it was size of that was changed to he ha. Got it? So it's literally a search and replace. Don't give it, don't think that what's going to happen. Be, nothing. It's a search and replace. If you screw it up, it's going to do that, that way. Are we okay with this? All right, good. That's why defined statements are very tricky, because sometimes you write something. That's why I always put everything capital like this. So I know this is an unusual thing. If you put it lowercase, sometimes you do an error, and you go over here, it says, like, uh, invalid something, and you bring it, so that's not it. What the heck? Okay? So whenever you see the error is showing like that, and it's showing completely different thing for that, you know that there's a defined statement somewhere. Got it? Are we good? So no he ha huh? five. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. So next thing. So let's save this. B dash uh, arrays. Complete. So that's everything about arrays. And now we're going to create a standard together. We are going to create a standard together. Now that I know arrays, I can actually hold someone's name in the array. So I can actually say character, name. What is the longest name you've ever heard? How many characters? 40, you said? 50, so go 51. Why do I add that one at the end? You don't want to pass this. I don't want to say, hello, I'm Fardad6, because F-A-R-D-A-D-6 is the length of my name. You don't want to do that, right? What is an impossible character? All characters have ASCII values, right? We know that. What is an impossible character that doesn't exist? It's the ASCII code zero, right? ASCII code zero doesn't co correspond to any character. It does, it's, not a, it's nothing to be shown. So we can use that as a stop sign. If I want to hold, hold Fardad in a character array, I can put F-A-R-D-A-D and make that one the ASCII code zero. So F-A-R-D-A-D will hold its ASCII value. The last one is zero. I have to always follow the rule of keep going until it, you hit zero. And when I'm reading, read and put, and when done, put a zero at the end to make sure everybody understands this is the end of data. 
So that's what I'm going to do. I know I can read a read, and let's call that a C string. Because it's a string of names, a string of characters, I'll call it a string. It's, I am calling, there is no string. I'm just calling it something so we know. So from now on, whenever I say string, I mean we have a character array that I'm putting a stop sign at the end of data with zero. Because you said a name, lo longest name would be 50. Somebody said, who said, you said 50? Yeah, 50, really? <laughs> Really? Oh, some of your friends have 50 characters? Holy mother. OK, so, <laughs> so I don't know how you call them. But anyways, so, so if it's 50, I need to put 50 characters. And I need one more space to put the null termination, the zero termination at the end. So if I want to hold for that, it's F-A-R-D-A-D, -A -D, that's 6. I have to make it 7 so I can put a zero at the end. So that's the price we are paying because we don't know what the size of data in the array is. And we have to always get a big size that a one size fits all type of a thing. Are we okay with this? So now if I want to read this, how do I do it? I'm going to call it void read string. Okay? And in here I'm going to say character string array, right? So character, character array. And what I need to do is to keep reading until it's done, right? So remember how we did it, how we found out what the, remember how we found out where the end of data is when we backslash n. Good. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to say over here character ch. I'm going to say do uh, ch is uh, do, uh, actually, I don't need a ch. I'm going to say integer i set to 0. And I'm going to say stri is set to get char. Right? It gets one character, correct? While while stri is not equal to backslash n. The problem is that I have to add 1 to the value of i, right? If I add to the value of i over here, I have to make this i minus 1 to be. Because, so I'm going to do it from the beginning. I'm going to do minus 1 over here, and I'm going to add over here. I'm going to do i plus plus. So I'm going to add at the beginning of the loop. OK? So. What happens? Then what happens over here? So let's walk through. It comes in. I want to read Fred, F-R-E-D. F-R-E-D. So that's the thing that is entered. So user enters. User enters. F-R-E-D. OK? Let's make the first one capitalized. So what happens? i is minus 1, right? It comes over here. Plus plus becomes what? 0. So that's the first element. Reads one character. f is red, correct? Then it comes over here. Is f backslash n? No. It goes up, right? Adds 1 to it. It becomes 1, correct? r is red. Goes up. Becomes 2. e is red. Becomes 3. d is red. Becomes 4, user hit enter, right? It's backslash n that comes in. Because user hits enter, backslash n is at the end always, right? So index 4, it will be backslash n, right? So it comes out. What is SDRI now? Backslash n, that's why it ended, correct? Well, we said we put 0 at the end, correct? So this is what I'm going to do. Done. I null terminated. Don't forget, this is not the character 0. This is the number 0. Number 0 is the ASCII code inside the character. It's not the character itself. If you are confused about it, you can do this. 
You, you know what is null? They defined it to zero in standard input output. Now I can actually tell you. In standard input output header file, we literally have defined null zero. <laughs> okay, so you put like that, that's just to remember that this is null. This is zero. This is not the character zero. And now let's see what we can do. And if I want to print a, str uh, a string, this is what I need to do. I'm going to come over here. So this is print string. Print string. And in print string, I'll do the exact same thing while not equal to zero. Actually, I have to do uh, the other while because I have to stop if it is. So it's entirely, uh, it, unlike the other one, I have to make sure that it's null, not null when I go through. So I'm going to say integer i set to zero while stri is not equal to null. Okay, then I'm going to say put care stri and i plus plus. Done. So that reads this prints. And then I can go to new line after. Do I have the utils? Yes, I do. So what I can do now in here is this. I can say printf, what is your name? Now I can say read string name. Now I can say printf, hello, print string name and go to new line. Right? When I run the program, first I'll run it, then I'll test it. Okay, so what's your name? My name is Fardat, and I hit enter. Hello, Fardat. You follow what happened? So because we don't have, are we, first of all, are we all okay with this? Yes. The whole idea of putting a stop sign at the end is not to do that. I am stopping. I am stopping when it's null. So I don't need the size. With integers, I can't do that. What if I want zero, the value zero integer? I cannot make it null terminated because zero is a valid integer. I'm lucky in characters, null is an invalid character. Because it's invalid, I do not need to. I do not need to worry about it. Are we okay with this? Yes. No, no. Letter A is 65. That's an integer. It's a very valid integer. Regular number arrays, impossible to do. You have to pass the size. Get over with it. With characters, we are lucky that we have an invalid value. We can use it as a stop sign, and that's what it's going to be used. Are we good with that? Be happy. This string that I told you is a standard between C programmers, which means instead of writing this crappy function that you see, I could have done this. So in here, I'm going to say uh, C string intro. You can actually do this. Scanf percent %s name. You don't need to put address of y. It's an array. It is already address of something. Arrays can change. You don't need to send their location to the function. All the other things I had to put ampersand. This I don't need to. And if I want to print the name, I'm going to say percent %s and name. And I can actually go to new line over here like that. Works the exact same way. Right? There is one catch. Scanf, delimiter. Mr. New Line and Buffered Entry. Scanf's delimiter, what is delimiter? It means where to stop, is white space. So my read string will read entire thing. So if I have my read string over here, I removed it. Ah, oh, you are. 
This is the end of it. Don't worry. So, ah, oh, I actually, I actually ran the other program of mine. I demonstrated this, but I ran the other. It works the same way. <laughs> so let me copy this. Copy. I, I didn't I didn't I didn't run that so I ran the other one actually so let me put it over here bring it up copy and I remove these so that becomes the new one and this one will be okay sorry I so I'll run it again to prove it to you. So it works the same way. So far that, and it runs, okay? But what I want to tell you is this. I'm going to now do the exact same thing again using read, string, um, uh, using read string over here. So I'm going to run the whole, put the whole thing over here, run it twice. This one, I'm going to use read string instead. So the first one, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say Fred Soleil, and I hit enter. It's going to say, hello, Fred Soleil, right? With scanf, I'm going to say Fred Soleil. It's going to say, hello, Fred. Because scanf's reading string stops at white space and null terminates it. The read string I wrote reads it to the end. OK, there is one another problem with it. With mine, backslash, backspace doesn't work. Because backspace is a character itself, so it's, it doesn't go backwards. With mine, you've got to keep reading. You keep backspace. So when you put backspace, it's got to be F-R-E. If you say far dude, I have to say F-R-D-O-O-D, -O -O -D, backspace, backspace, backspace. Instead of fixing it, it's going to add three backspaces. Uh, so mine is crappy, believe me. There are other ways to make printf to actually stop at backslash n. You can do that. So if I want the equivalent of read string in your scanf, you have to write it like this. You have to say read the string up to and not including backslash n. So if you put this one, it is up to new line. If you put this one, it is up to uh, white space. Done. So if you do like this, you can actually, you can replace this backslash with anything. So you can say stop at comma. So it goes and stops at comma. Remember, it doesn't read the comma. It remains in buffer. You have to flush it. OK? But that's what it is. Are we OK? Done. OK, so that's essentially what strings are. They're arrays. And there is, so uh, never ever think that in C language, at any level, we have a type called string. There is no such a thing. It's just a standard all the C programmers follow, which means put the data and null terminate it. So in an interview, you're going to be asked, I'm telling you, when you're getting a call. When you're, when you're getting a call for an interview for a C thing, the very first thing they ask to see if you know the language or you just know the language, they ask you, what is a C string? You have to say, it's a null terminated array of characters. There is no such thing as string. This is extremely important for you to know. But because it's so useful, this standard has been imprinted in all standard input output functions. We have functions to do all, deal with all these things. We'll go through them one by one. Questions? Suggestions? Yes. What is a mathematical expression? An element of an integer is an integer. Anything you do with an integer, you do with an element of the array. So I, I literally meant that. If you say integer b, anything you do to b, you can do to a too. They are both integers, both doubles, both characters, any array. <clears throat> no, if you want to individually deal with one of them, just deal with that one. So you say, I want the third integer? Just say, 
scanf uh, and you put ampersand a3 oh sorry a2 because third is 0 1 2 so that's that okay all right have a beautiful